USS Vesuvius was named after the implacable Italian volcano for a very good reason, her unique dynamite main guns. It was an unusual concept, born in the late 1880s, that would mark a departure from conventional forms of main battery armament. An otherwise unremarkable cruiser, with three 15-inch cannons that crowned her deck, she nonetheless instilled unprecedented terror in her enemies because of her never-before-seen charge, even being called by the New York Times as the most destructive craft ever launched at the time. Vesuvius was ready to join the U.S. Navy efforts in Cuba before the turn of the century and relentlessly harassed the capital in the summer of 1898. Still, unlike her namesake, Vesuvius did not explode in a loud roar and had a specific quality that continually shattered her enemy's spirit. Unconventional Approach When the authorization to build the first dynamite gun cruiser was obtained, one of the most unique vessels in the inventory of the U.S. Navy emerged. It was August of 1886, and Vesuvius became the third ship named after the Italian volcano, but the only one to feature somewhat eccentric pieces of weaponry. Her hull was laid down in Philadelphia roughly a year later by William Cramp and Son Ships and Engine Building Company, a subcontractor from the Pneumatic Dynamite Gun Company in New York City. Then, on April 28, 1888, she was finally launched, but not commissioned until two years later, with Lieutenant Seton Schroeder in command. Vesuvius was 246 feet 3 inches long and 14 feet deep, with a beam of 26 feet 6 inches, while her displacement amounted to 930 long tons. Her propulsion system comprised 183 horsepower 4-cylinder triple expansion steam engines, which gave her a top speed of 21 knots. Theoretically, the cruiser could fire 30 projectiles or 500 pounds of gun cotton, dynamite, or other high explosives within a half hour. She also carried three rare firearms known as pneumatic dynamite torpedo guns mounted forward side by side. The guns functioned on compressed air and were invented by D.M. Medford and developed by Captain Edmund Zelinsky. The latter saw a live demonstration of Medford's small air gun as early as 1883 and went on to perfect it. After succeeding at smaller caliber prototypes, Zelinsky then developed a 15-inch version. The dynamite gun cruiser's armament consisted of a fixed installation of three 15-inch pneumatic guns and an outfit of 10 shells for each one. To train the unusual weapons, the ship had to be aimed at its target in the same fashion as a gun, with the elevation fixed at 16 degrees. And in terms of range of flight, it could vary from 200 yards to one and a half nautical miles, depending on the amount of air entering the chamber. Still, it was too short, even for its time. Shells containing 550 pounds of explosives could be launched as far away as one mile, but to extend the range, the projectile weight had to be reduced to 200 pounds, eventually reaching 4,000 yards. The range could also be reduced by releasing less compressed air from the reservoir. Meanwhile, the gun barrels measured 55 feet, and the 15-foot muzzles extended through the deck 37 feet abaft the bow. Also, the shells were made of steel or brass casings, and employed an electrical fuse to be either set to detonate on contact or underwater. The seven-foot projectiles contained the explosive in the forward conical-shaped section of the casing, and rotation was achieved through spiral vanes to the afterpart. Still, developing a reliable dynamite-based projectile before the 20th century was a task easier said than done. No warning. The dynamite gun cruiser sailed for New York shortly after commissioning. Vesuvius then joined the fleet at Gardner's Bay on October 1st, 1890, and operated off the East Coast with the North Atlantic Squadron for the next five years. Her role included numerous port visits, participation in local observances of holidays, and significant gunnery exercises. Despite her modest success, the naval service would soon learn that her promising guns had limited usefulness and were taken aback by the setback shock experienced when firing them. To diminish the tendency of premature explosion, the compressed air would have a smoother impact on the projectiles than a conventional explosive charge. Moreover, the projectiles generally carried nitrocellulose or nitroglycerin, a so-called desensitized blasting gelatin. While being less sensitive than regular dynamite, the explosive could still be sensitive enough to propel the charge and avoid the use of powder. In addition to the insufficient range of the battery, the aiming method was considered clumsy and, even worse, inaccurate. On the other hand, Zelinsky's invention was well received by the army, 
and in 1894, a battery of three 15-inch pneumatic guns was installed at Sandy Hook, New Jersey. The following year, another set was placed at Fort Winfield, Scott, California, and before the turn of the century, the Army's Chief of Ordnance reported that they had successfully, quote, placed in serviceable condition the pneumatic gun batteries at the ports of New York and San Francisco. Meanwhile, Vesuvius was decommissioned in April of 1895 for major repairs, which had her out of action until January of 1897. Re-entering service under the command of Lieutenant Commander John E. Pillsbury, she departed from the Philadelphia Navy Yard, bound for Florida. Vesuvius continued her career on the familiar East Coast until mid-1898. At that time, the relations between the U.S. and Spain were growing more tense, and the cruiser hurried south and joined the American fleet gathered at Florida waters. She then joined the Cuban blockade on May 28th. Two weeks later, the cruiser would execute her first bombardment mission against Santiago de Cuba's defenses. Stealthily, under cover of darkness, Vesuvius closed the shore and lost her first real combat round with her dynamite charges, eventually retiring into the sea. Still, her potent guns had a psychological advantage. The dynamite cruiser caused significant anxiety among the Spanish forces stationed in Cuba due to her silent yet devastating shelling. Unaccompanied by the usual roar of gunfire during bombardments, her furtive attacks had an unexpected impact. Admiral William Thomas Sampson would even call the ship's bombardments, quote, a great effect. While relatively quiet, Vesuvius's attacks were unique. Gunpowder-detonated artillery shells had a characteristic sound that differed from the dynamite charges. And yet, soldiers who witnessed the explosions would say that the cruiser's projectiles, quote, made holes like the cellar of a country house. Repurpose Throughout July of 1898, Vesuvius served several special duties, including as a dispatch boat between the island and the peninsula. During the conflict, she would conduct no less than eight shore bombardments against the Cuban capital. Despite Admiral Sampson's optimistic assessment, Vesuvius was generally considered less than effective. In truth, being an experimental vessel, she was studied by naval experts from around the world and got mixed notices, tending towards the negative. Realistically speaking, the ship's relative success in Cuba could have been a case of mere chance, as the accuracy of fixed guns firing at a target shrouded in darkness involves something other than aim. After hostilities ended in the summer, the cruiser returned home to the north. And on September 16th, she was taken out of active service, remaining at the Boston Navy Yard until 1904. After that, she was converted to a torpedo testing ship and stripped of her infamous main battery in favor of four torpedo tubes. She was recommissioned in June of 1905 and sailed to the Naval Torpedo Station at Newport to start anew. Vesuvius then took a new role, conducting several torpedo experiments, only stopping for brief repair works and occasionally serving as a station ship. Close call. Once in 1913, Vesuvius suffered an accident that could have been disastrous were it not for the crew's prompt response. As the New York Times put it, quote, while at torpedo instruction, something went wrong. A whitehead torpedo that had just been launched by the cruiser circled back and struck her stern, puncturing her hull and making a six-inch hole. Water flooded in as the ship began to settle. Chief Gunner Thomas Smith reacted quickly and headed towards the beach, the inrush of water as much as possible. Hammocks and blankets were used in an effort to patch the hole, but a call of distress was still issued. Soon, several vessels and the torpedo station responded, while Vesuvius covered the three miles that separated her from the nearest land, Prudence Island in Narragansett Bay. Given the quick judgment of her skipper, she did not sink nor suffer crucial damage. Intentionally ran aground, the ship was spared from a gruesome end against the rocks and came to rest on the soft sand instead. She was then decommissioned on October 21st, 1921 and ordered appraised for sale. Six months later, she was sold for scrap. During her career, Vesuvius was awarded the Samson Medal, the Spanish Campaign Medal, and the World War I Victory Medal. Her bell is on display at Bristol, Rhode Island, and a complete model is housed at the National Museum of the U.S. Navy at the Washington Navy Yard. Having once shown incredible potential, Vesuvius was eventually immortalized by Navy historian Anthony Preston in his book, The World's Worst Warships. Thank you for watching my video. If you enjoyed it, please give us a thumbs up. And for more history-inspired content, don't forget to subscribe to all of our Dark Documentaries channels. Also, let us know your thoughts in the comments section below, and stay tuned for more.